Yeah. All right, it's two o'clock. All right, let's do it. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, my welcome. name is Tim Roberts. And Brent White. Uh, we're here to talk about security guards. Uh, specifically, we're uh, discussing red team and physical security assessments, uh, as well as on-site uh, social engineering assessments and uh, the opportunities that we've had to manipulate security guards and convincing them to give us access to systems uh, into restricted areas or their actual keys. And we're not, we're not hating on security guards. Kind of the whole point of the talk is to point out the flaw of so much of the physical security uh, program resting upon often one or two security guards for an entire complex. So we're gonna we're gonna share some more stories and how we were able to exploit and, and uh, get to areas we shouldn't have been able to uh, with the help of specifically security guards. So it's a little bit of uh, random information about us. And as you can tell from this slide, we're very immature. So uh, you know, that's that. So scoping requirements, uh, what's the primary goal of the assessment? Usually when you're doing, if you're familiar with penetration assessments, if you're doing red team, physical or social engineering, um, you want to, you define this stuff during the kickoff call or prior to the kickoff call when the sales guy says, hey, you know, here's what you're buying. Um, but during this, you want to make sure that it is conveyed. Uh, red team assessments are kind of the, the whole gambit. Um, you have a primary goal, I'm going to either get into the server room, I, I'm either going to obtain data this way or get into this restricted area. Uh, but ultimately you're acting like a criminal. What would a criminal do and how would they get inside the facility? Uh, oftentimes I've had clients, uh, well we'll get inside, we'll get into the server room, we'll get access to their, the rack, we could take the server off the rack, walk out, whatever, and we've completely owned the place and then, you know, when you give them the report, they're like, wait a minute, uh, we found on our Nessus finding that we have Telnet open and you guys did not report on that. And making sure that that kind of stuff is clear that, you know, that's not the point of these kinds of assessments. That's not the point of like advanced persistent threat uh, types of self assessments or uh, reality based assessments. And so, you know, during the kickoff call, one of a few of the things that we always make sure to cover so that no one is, is uh, you know, irritated or highly upset after the fact. Um, once we get inside the building, because at this point, I think we've never not gotten into where we've intended to at this point. So when basically when we get inside, are we able to are we able to uh, touch things? Can we see if we can get into a system? If we see something lying around like a hard drive or laptop or something, can we take that out of the, the facilities? So we, we try to establish those parameters with what is acceptable and what isn't pretty early on. Uh, and something that might seem pretty obvious, but it's very important to note too, the start and the stop time of the assessment. You want to make sure that the client understands, okay, uh, you guys can start Monday uh, and you're not showing up Sunday night and starting too early and then they're wondering, okay, what in the world's going on? Nobody's supposed to be trying anything which, as you can imagine, can lead to bigger issues. Or after hours so. stuff too, because oftentimes when we do these assessments, they'll have like an after like a cleaning crew uh, at night, and you'll see them prop open the door because they're moving equipment in and out, uh, cleaning equipment, and the security guard sitting there with his headphones on and watching, you know, Hulu. So, you know, is it, is it okay for us to try this at after hours? And, and actually pitch that too. If you're a pen tester or whatever, and you're doing these kinds of assessments, pitch that, you know, hey, don't limit us to just production hours. Let us do these after hours assessments too, uh, just to kind of see what that risk is because chances are a real criminal is not going to go in, um, you know, that, that boldly uh, during the uh, production day and, and say whatever. Right. So once you have all that information and then you also have your, your contact information for your, what we call the get out of jail free card or the letter of authorization, uh, which by the way, a quick pro tip on that, make sure you have you always have more than one point of contact on that list because we've actually had situations where the main point of contact that scheduled the assessment and everything completely forgot about it and went on vacation. So when we were contacting him, he was nowhere to be found and that was not fun. Yep. So, Incident response and testing. Uh, we always like to add this on there as well, and this is often where we encounter security guards. So we'll, we'll get into a facility, uh, we gain access to the systems, 
we pulled some SQL databases or whatever, uh, and we were good to go for the most part. Well, at that point, you're like, well, you know, we're scheduled for the whole week to be here, and we did this in a day or two, so what are we going to do? Well, let's start, attack let's start focusing on pushing the bounds. Let's uh, go up to the security guards and see if they're going to notice us doing this, or let's, uh, let's ask for things that, you know, typically you wouldn't ask for, like their keys. Um, and, and it's work. I've got a story for you in a moment. But uh, with this stuff, the way we typically do this is with a uh, fake letter of authorization. Um, I make a fake letter of authorization saying I am um, Elliot Otterson with Fishtail Security, and, uh, and then I put the White House's address on there, and I usually put Brent's name as a point of contact authorized for ABC Corporation saying that I'm here for a security assessment. Uh, this kind of approach allows for us to, uh, to oftentimes um, give, this, give this letter if we're caught. Like, for example, um, I was picking a lock one time, and a security guard walked up behind me. I didn't hear him. And he's looking over my shoulder. He's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, hey, buddy. I'm just nothing. <laughs> and uh, I was caught, you know, and it was, it was really difficult at that point to lie out of it. So what did I do is I leaned on this fake letter of authorization. And the reason why I used that initially was because if I was a real criminal, how would I get in here and get free access to everything or free reign of the building? Um, well, I would pretend that I'm here doing a security assessment. So I gave him the fake letter. He just glazed over it, didn't read it in detail, didn't follow up, you know, didn't follow process and due diligence. And he's like, oh, cool, I'm with security too. And I was like, oh, no joke. Yeah, the security badge gave that away. Yeah, if, if um, he would have paid any attention to that letter, it was very obvious that it was not legitimate because, as Tim said, it had the address of the White House and a lot of other random things on there. So. And what's funny about that too is that I had told him, I was like, hey, yeah, you are with security. I'm going to be here the rest of the week. Could you let the rest of your team know? That way they don't bother me. And he's like, oh, yeah, absolutely. So I had free reign of the facility the entire time without the security guards bugging me um, just because he didn't he didn't follow up he didn't check the point of contact and didn't do his part so incident incident response and testing is is also important for these kinds of assessments yeah and again make sure that you always know who to escalate the situation to if you are caught that way you know you're not getting arrested or other non-fun things so most of this talk is going to have war stories uh, it's just basically the stories that that we're sharing the experiences that we've had uh, we've got several different types. Uh, we just kind of com compiled them into uh, some of our favorites uh, for this talk. Uh, this one specifically, um, security systems. I was, uh, I was at this facility. I had gotten into the facility from the uh, fire escape. I picked the lock. I saw people kind of leaving uh, during lunch, so I knew the alarm wasn't set. But he was going out the fire escape exits, and they were just coming in and out. So I was like, oh, okay, cool. Let's go over there. It's a basic tumbler lock. Picked it, got inside. Walked around the facility, and from there I was able to piggyback, do a bunch of other stuff. Uh, and basically, we got access to tons of data. Well, I found out where the server room was. I'd ask somebody, hey, where's the server room? You know, whatever, I'm doing inventory. And they're like, oh, yeah, it's downstairs. They didn't ask second guess uh, or ask me any questions or push any further. Uh, I got downstairs to where the server room was, and I noticed there was a biometric scanner on it. And I was like, oh, crap, I can't really get into this. I don't, I don't know how to get into this, or I didn't have the equipment. Uh, so I noticed there was a clipboard beside it. I grabbed the clipboard, and then uh, I look over, and there's a security guard that's sitting there talking to a maintenance guy, and his desk is right around the corner. And he's got cameras and everything there, and I was like, oh, well, I'm going to take this opportunity to see if they'll let me into this room. So I walk over there with the clipboard. I flip the piece of paper out. It was the visitor log, and they had it on the outside of the door. I flipped it out. I wrote inventory, and I wrote a bunch of fake numbers down, and Dell, blah, blah, blah. I walk over and I just go directly to the server uh, of the system, the security systems there, and I start looking on the back at the metal plate for the serial numbers. So I start writing out serial numbers. I'm like, hey guys, I'm just here. I'm doing some inventory. I got to get some of these uh, serial numbers off these systems. And he's like, oh, okay. And I was like, yeah, we're thinking about replacing them and upgrading them. And I'm just BSing with the guy. And, and he, automatically he established this rapport with me because he starts complaining about the systems and how crappy they are. And I was like, yeah, you know, we're going to replace them, and we're just doing some inventory at this campus, and we're looking at some of these other facilities. And I was like, oh, okay, great. He goes, I really wish you guys would replace these, uh, these systems. And I was like, oh, yeah, what's going on with them? He's like, well, first of all, the cameras suck. They're all, you know, there's no HD. I can't see license plate numbers if somebody were to do anything. Camera one and camera three are down. And I was like, oh, could you show me? And he's like, 
yeah, yeah, come around here. So I come around, and he logs into the system, passwords 1111, gets into the system, pulls it up, shows me that two of their cameras are down, starts talking about the resolution, it's awful, and all this other stuff. And I was like, yeah, you know, we're going to do what we can to help. And he didn't even ask who I was with, but I had a fake letter or a fake badge on that I'd printed off and just stuck it on an adhesive paper and put it on a, a blank head badge. And, uh, and he took it for that. But, you know, beforehand we had done some recon and found out what the badges looked like and was able to, to make a pretty legitimate badge without cloning them. So I'm sitting there, I'm talking to this guy, uh, the facilities guy is there, um, and we're all laughing and having a good time. I was like, oh, before I go, maybe you could help me out. I look at the maintenance guy or the facilities guy. And uh, he's like, oh, yeah, what do you need? And I said, well, I need to get into the server room, um, and I need to get a few serial numbers off the boxes in there. Could you help me out? He's like, uh, well, I don't have access to that. And he looks over at the security guard with his feet propped up on the desk, laughing and all jovial. And he's like, oh, yeah, I'll let you in. I was like, okay, cool. So he escorts me over to the biometric scanner. He scans in, lets me in, and I now have unfettered access to the data center. They left me in there. They didn't escort me or anything like that. So there, I mean, it's a huge negligence there, right? But uh, I, I was in the facility for I don't know how long, and I got to do basically whatever I wanted to. Uh, so from there, I was able to plug into their core switch and run some scans and do some dumps. Yeah, and that just kind of shows, again, the whole thing about the talk is that, you know, the maintenance man didn't have the access that he needed. And so through the rapport, the, the security guard was able to bypass all that and let a, total, a completely unauthorized user in there. Um, so yeah, point one proven right there. So um, an assessment that we did not too long ago, uh, there were three different buildings for this client. It was a large client. And so um, the, first, the first building we were in after we had completely, I don't want to say destroyed, I mean, yeah, I guess we kind of did, but uh, so while we were there, Tim has a funny story about this about this one coming up too. But uh, while we were doing some passive recon, we learned that they were doing group hiring that week, so that was great. So I went over, uh, a guy named Drew that we work with went over and sat on the couch next to them and grabbed a business card and got all the information and, and he handed it off to me. So as we went to that uh, the next facility, I, I put on a suit and I went in and. Uh, you know, it was kind of walked in the door to the security guard, and uh, it was hot the day, that day, so I was sweating. And I was like, look, I've got an interview here with so-and-so. Uh, here's her card. And the guard was like, well, those interviews are at a different location. And that was, other location is like 50 miles away. Yeah, it was, so. it was a pretty good distance away. And I was like, well, I had talked to her earlier, and she was going to meet me up here about that time. Uh, if I have a rough day, you know, I've uh, ran out of the house, and I left my resume on my desk, and... I don't have time to go get it printed off again. So um, I handed him USB. It had, you know, the PDF had reverse interpreter shell, uh, you know, payload in it for reverse interpreter shell. Uh, we had another guy sitting at home at his desk just waiting for something to connect. Uh, unfortunately, he was like, sorry, we're not allowed to plug anything in. And I was, you know, so I would, you know, come on, please, I really need this job. And, you know, sob story. And, he just wasn't buying it. He's like, besides, I don't have internet access to this computer on this computer. So he was like, okay, that's that's fine. So I was like, well, what what can I do? And he's like, well, here's here's an application. You can go fill it out. So um, he's like, all right, that works. So the whole time, Tim and Drew are outside. They were trying to get in a back door while this was going on, and uh, there wasn't any. There wasn't a camera yeah, back there. Was, there. A, there wasn't a camera in the back door yeah. or anything. And, uh, and so we're like, oh, great. Let's just try to bypass this door and get in. And we're sitting there trying to work on it. <clears throat> anyway, we couldn't get in. So we had to come around to the front. Yeah, so I, I was as I was up there, uh, they let me know that they were about to come in the front door. So I went back up to the security guard and started acting agitated and doing anything I could to distract. So as they came in, uh, some of the badges that we had gotten from a uh, security control room the day before uh, Tim was wearing a contractor badge. It had a picture of like a, a Middle Eastern guy on it. It looked nothing like me, so I just had the badge flipped over, and then you know the other guy had a generic contractor badge. Yeah, it was printed. I've had a picture of Alec Baldwin on it. <laughs> yeah, and so, we made it. Yeah, so sometimes when we do this, we'll we'll do absurd things on the badges just to see to kind of give them the benefit of the doubt to see if they're paying attention at all. Because if they pay attention at all, then they'll be like, 
you're obviously not Alec Baldwin, come with me, you know. And real criminals are going to so. spend more diligence in this. But the thing is, is this was like the third facility that we had been to for this company. Yeah. And so after like, you know, the first two was, was completely easy. And we're like, you know, let's just do some something stupid here. Let's uh, let's, let's have take some fun this. With it. Let's just have some fun with it, see if they even pay attention. We're really going to just just push this. And, and the reason why we do this too is just, I mean, it's not to troll anybody or anything like that, but it's just, again, you know, after you've done so much, you just want to push to that next boundary and just to see, is anybody really paying attention to this stuff? Yeah. You or are want, they just glancing yeah, over it? You want to give them a chance to catch you. It's like how obvious do you have to be before someone says, oh, why are you doing jumping jacks in front of our camera, you know, to see you know, waving and no one comes. So um, as, as, they text me saying they were going to come in the front door. I was like, well, hold on just a second. So I went up to the guard, you know, more sob story, and I was trying to act irritated to, to make it awkward. So they come in, and the guard's like, well, let me see your badges. So I kind of interrupt, and Tim flashes his badge, the Middle Eastern picture. Well, I'm, I'm flashing it from back here, too, like, because I was like, oh, crap, you know, this does not look at me like me at all. So I just kind of hold it up and set it back down. And she's trying yeah. to trying to get a good look at it, too. Yeah, and, and so, uh, so as... as the security guard was saying, no, wait, come here. Uh, they just keep walking, and I keep interrupting. And so uh, we kind of used that to, to head them off, and, and they're like, oh, we're, it's fine. We're here to check Internet speeds or whatever. I think install fiber is what they said, something that ridiculous. And we're running some fiber, I think. Yeah, running right. fiber is what he said. <laughs> and so, um, so they get back there, and so I'm finally like, I was like, look, I'm sorry. I'm upset. I just, you know, I really need this job. And that sounds awful, <laughs> Every time I tell a story, I'm like, man, I'm a horrible person. <laughs> so, but, uh, and by the way, at the end of these assessments, when we reveal our stuff, I always make it a point to apologize to the person because I feel awful, you know. So, uh, so they were walking by, and I was sitting on the couch, you know, filling out the application. And after, after about two or three minutes, the uh, security guard starts making a phone call, like, hey, were you expecting some contractors in today to, you know, like, check the Internet? He wasn't really sure what to say. Or she, it was a female. Yeah, it was, like, it was a female. She wasn't person. sure what to say, and so that person was like, no, we're not expecting anyone. Call so-and-so. So the next person she called was out of town. She couldn't get a hold of anyone. So then she starts to panic a little bit, and I'm watching this from uh, just a few feet away, and she starts calling in some of the other female employees of the office, saying, hey, uh, some contractors came in, and I just kind of have a weird feeling about them, and uh, I called so-and-so, and they're not expecting anyone here. And so then about by the time she was finishing this conversation, there were like four or five employees gathered around the desk and everyone's getting really nervous. And so they're like, well, we need to go find these guys and see what's going on. And so I, I kind of jumped in. I was like, are you talking about the two, uh, the two contractors that came in while we were talking? And, and she was like, yeah, those guys. Did anything seem weird? I was like, they look like contractors to me, but if you're looking for them, they went that way. And but they actually the had walked direction. the opposite way. <laughs> so all these employees are running down the hallway the wrong way. While these, and I told Tim, I, I was like, hey, they are actively searching. You need to get out now. And so during this whole time, it was pretty funny because uh, Drew and Tim, they, they went up to a, a, a female employee there. And they're like, hey, we're here to run some fiber, but we've, we need to do some testing. And so... Uh, he, Tim had a key logger, and he was like, yeah, I'm just going to plug this in and gather some data, but first I need you to lock your machine. So she does that. He plugs it in, and he's like, okay, go ahead and unlock it now, of course, so you know, so he can get the creds. And he's like, uh, he's like okay, it looks like it's running well. I'm going to leave it here for about an hour. And then right after he says that. Well, we start I, to walk away, like, right after that. Yeah, so. It's so, very quick. Yeah, he's like, so I'm going to leave it here for about an hour. And then he gets the text, leave now, they're actively searching. And then seriously, about 30 seconds later, he's like, yeah, that's probably long <laughs> enough. And then he pulls that out of there. And so, uh, and they had been talking to some of their employees, like, oh, yeah, we've been around the building for a few days. And then they get that text, and Drew was like, oh, and by the way, where are the stairs again? You know, so by that, that point, it was, uh, it was, basically over and so they ran out and so I went up to the security guard I was trying to not raise suspicion and I was like well you know hey I'm really sorry that I bothered you today it looks like I got the dates confused and I'm supposed to be here tomorrow so I'll make sure to bring my resume thank you for your time and just stroll out and they pull up in front of the building and we uh and we were gone so. yeah we had parked a couple blocks down but we ran out the uh the stairs and we were able to get away before anybody caught us but you know in like five minutes though we were able to come go in there distract them, get domain credentials, and then leave. I mean, that, that was really a really quick thing. And, yeah, uh, super quick. 
you know, of course, we were being absurdly obvious about some things, but, uh, but yeah, it was very quick. And again, that just goes to show the reason that I wanted to share that story with you is because this entire facility, which I think was like a four or five stories, and it, it was a pretty good sized facility with multiple entrances. They had based basically their entire physical security on one security guard at the front entrance. And so just from me coming in and making up a story about needing to print off a resume, two other guys were able to get in and go capture credentials. So, I mean, that's just something that obviously needs to be addressed. And we'll get to some of that in a little bit later as far as security awareness training and stuff. So. And it's just that distraction, too. When you put, uh, oftentimes you're not going to see a, you're going to see a company and they're going to be like, you know, we're going to spend a lot of money, we're going to hire armed security guards and they're going to be patrolling, they're going to be doing all this stuff, we're going to have real-time monitoring of our systems or of our cameras, you know, and that's great. Other times you're going to be like, hey, Nancy, um, I know you're our secretary here, but you know we're going to give you this hat too. Now you're our security guard, and we're going to make you also. You know, could you clean up the place too? Now you're yeah. our custodian, and now you're this and this and this, and you're stacking multiple roles on one person, mm -hmm. and it becomes ridiculous because this is your first layer, and we're going to talk about this, but this is your first layer of security, and they're supposed to be monitoring that, especially when. You know, there's only two points of entry and exit. You know, the back door, great. Well, they didn't even have cameras back there. Yeah, Luckily, they had a, a pretty tight, you know, lock on it, and we couldn't get in. Um, and access control there was pretty solid. But the front door was the primary place. So as soon as that person's distracted or she has to get up and go to the restroom, you know, what, what's preventing somebody from walking in there? And uh, aside from just security, you know, this is also safety, safety risk. And we always say this to people, it's like, well, real cri criminals may not be that brazen. Well, maybe not, but an active shooter is going to be, you know, or somebody that's there to, to do something or steal something or, or hurt somebody. Yeah, disgruntled former employee that just wants some revenge or, you know, or a, a, a ex-spouse of an employee that's coming in. And, I mean, there's so many different scenarios we could run through, but it boils down to, you know, what, what do you have in place to protect your people, basically. So, all right, let's move <clears throat> All right, so this is one of my favorite stories. Um, we'd gotten into the facility uh, actually with a shove knife. Um, they had a deviated strike plate at the back of the door, and there was a big gap, and we were very quickly just able to stick that in there and get in the back door. Uh, the with, camera with a, coverage. A $10 tool. Yeah, a $10 tool you can get online or you can make on your own. It's pretty easy. Um, so we got into the facility. After a while, we tailgated to some sensitive areas. Uh, there was actually a shredder bin, too, that used to be an old chemical bin. It was huge, this massive shredder, shredder bin, and it had a forklift um, slots in the side of it. So they had this really nice, I don't know what kind of lock it was, it was like this uh, super nice padlock, or uh, it was like a best uh, padlock on there, and it was, it, was, uh, it was hard to pick. We sit there trying to pick it forever. Yeah, it was pretty, pretty tough, uh, security pins, things like that. Yeah, so we're sitting there trying to pick this lock, and uh, on the side of this, this shredder bin, you know, they've got the forklift holes. Well, Drew has tiny arms, and he's like, you know, I'm just going to shove my arm in here and play bingo. And so he sticks his arm in there, and he pulls out this wad of paper and tons of, of information. There were scanned driver's license. There was, like, uh, applications for, uh, for like, uh, overseas. passports, overseas yeah, stuff. An actual passport scan. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was a lot of sensitive data that he was able to just pull out of there from, from that. So, you know, shredder bins, always pay attention. I don't care how awesome your locks are. I mean, it's the same thing for doors. I don't care how awesome the locks are on the door when you're, when you've got your hinges externally facing. I can just pop those out or something. Right? Yeah, we call uh, the shredder bin thing. We call it shredder bin, uh, shredder bin bingo. Yeah, that's kind of we go see what we get. So usually pretty lucky, unfortunately. And, and yeah, we've gotten really lucky with a lot of that. Um, so we had been walking around for quite a while, and um, and Drew went, had split off from from Brent and I. And uh, I went downstairs and I saw this room. It was the security control room. Well, the door had a uh, window on it, and you could see uh, in there. And I saw tons of, of screens. It's where the security system was, their camera system, uh, their badge printing system. And they also had a box uh, full of keys in there. And the keys were uh, for the vehicles, uh, the server room, uh, multiple facility keys were found in there. So I was like, this is the room I need to get in here. And so I'm trying to pick it. I realized it's a dimple lock. I didn't even have dimple picks on me. And I was like, well, crap, you know, I'm going to have a hard time getting in this. Um, so Brent and I decided to go upstairs. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to ask the security guard for her keys. So we go up there. I had a contractor badge on. Brent had like a fake employee badge on. 
In addition, we had uh, this, this clipboard that I made. Um, it's just an RFID thief. Um, it's got a few different sensors in here. So, but I always carry this clipboard with me. And so I had it on it. And I was like, oh, I'm doing key inventory. Key and badge inventory was, was my guys. So I walk out to the security guard and I was like, hey, you know, I'm just doing uh, some key and badge inventory stuff. I just need to ask you a few questions about your badge process for your one-day badges in case employees forget their badges or something like that. She's like, oh, okay. And she looks at the badges that we made, the fake ones. Didn't ask us a question or anything. And we're, as Brent's sitting there talking to her, yeah, I was like, I'm, oh, to, I'm talking to her about lunch recommendations, just anything that kind of distract. So. Yeah, so it was distracting her, and I was like, hey, you know, and I laid my, the binder on top of her, her badge binder. And uh, I was like, actually, you know, is it okay if I just flip through this a little bit? She's like, yeah, sure. So I go back, and I sit down behind the desk beside her, and I start talking to her, and I'm establishing this rapport. And uh, as I'm doing this, I flip over in her binder, and I'm sitting there scanning the, the, the badges. Hey, on. He's, like, he's rubbing it on the thing in circular motion, and it's very loud. Well, because I, I disabled the, the audio notification to let you know it beeped, and so sometimes I, sometimes I have to scan it a few different times, and then when I go back and look at the log to clone them, I notice that I've got like, I've scanned it like 50 times, but you know, I like to make sure. So um, I'm sitting there with this clipboard doing this, and, uh, and I was like, well, now I gotta ask her for her keys. Because I didn't want to just go straight up to her and ask her for it. I wanted to establish this kind of uh, authority, right? Yeah, real this... quick before you go on to that, we have a picture of Tim with the security guards behind the desk with his feet propped up on the desk with the gigantic binder of all the visitor and contractor badges. Like, it's it's pretty funny <laughs> picture. So. We, can't, we didn't put that in the report, yeah, though. Not a lot. Um, but so I'm sitting there, and I, I was like, well, I pull out my bump keys. I usually just carry them on me. I mean, we don't use bump keys like on client site because you scratch up the pins and all that stuff. But I have these uh, bump keys on me. So I pull them out and I was like, oh yeah, John from facilities said that, uh, for, he gave me these keys and I was supposed to get in the security control room so I could do some key inventory in there. And he said that they, uh, that, I mean, I couldn't get them to work. He said, just to ask you, uh, is it all right? Could you let me into that room or could I borrow your keys? I promise I'll bring them right back. In fact, I'm just going to leave my keys here. And I just keep talking to her, doing this quick talk, right? And, uh, and she's like, uh, sure. Just make sure you bring them back before six because I got to lock the doors. Yeah. It was like, it was like an hour or 45 minutes before then. So he was trying to do like the time sensitive thing here. So. Yeah, so she's like, okay, and so she gives me her keys. Well, now I have the key, the security guard's keys to get into mostly everything in the facility. And so we go downstairs, and we go to the uh, security control room, and, I mean, it's a pretty congested hallway, too. So that was, I mean, picking it was, we were sweating there when we had tried to pick yeah. it previously. <laughs> um, and I was like, well, this is going to be difficult. So anyway, I use the key. I'm sitting there. I'm trying to find out what key it is. Well, Brent hears somebody start to walk. And, uh, and I was like, oh, crap. He's yeah. like, hurry, hurry, you know. And so we get into this room. Oh, yeah. So uh, so with this particular uh, client, they, they did have security guards, but they also had their maintenance men acting as sort of eye, like active eyes, if you want to call they it. They worked with physical security, yeah. which is often the case. You'll have the facility guys working with whoever's running the physical right. security for the building. So they were kind of getting skeptical of us anyway because we had been in that building for hours that day, just going everywhere. And uh, and so one of the guys, he started to come around the corner, and, and right at almost the exact time, I don't think we could have timed it better, it was perfect. He, uh, right when he peeked around the corner, Tim opens the door, and then we close it really quick, and the lights were off in this room. So we duck under a, a desk that was about this size, like an L-shaped desk, and we're both like bunched under there, just looking at this window, waiting for this guy to come in. And I was like... Tim, what do, we, what do we say if the guy comes in here and he's like, uh, surprise? I don't know. So we were sitting there waiting. Luckily, he never came, and uh, we turned the flashlight on and, like, like pillaged through all the keys and everything. Yeah, they had, so. like, a, they had an aluminum box. with It was like a wafer lock. So yeah. we're, we, we popped the box open, and inside of this aluminum box was uh, keys to their vehicles, keys to their server room for multiple campuses, keys for the entire facility. They were all hard keys, right? And so and, we and the badge uh, the badge room where and they, they had the, the badge badges, yeah. yeah the badge maker in there too we were going to try to print off a badge but we were really time sensitive so what we did was we took some pictures of the uh, server room keys some really detailed pictures and we ended up going to Lowe's later that night and we got a file and a blank key and uh, we were able to file the key and use that key to get into a server room at another facility uh, which was you know pretty handy yeah uh, Drew Culbertson helped out with that yeah. a lot he uh, 
he was pretty crafty on that. But that was pretty good uh, arts and crafts time at the hotel, you know, for entrance to wherever he wanted to go at the other facilities. So oh, something I do want to mention here too: uh, the compressed air. So the rec sensors, we uh, we used that once we were inside. You know, they had access control everywhere, and we were still trying to to clone some badges. But we ended up uh, getting getting into some sensitive areas just using some compressed air that we found there. We turned it upside down, spray it between the crack, and then trip the rec sensor on the other side, and then get, walk into the uh, these doors. So we did that a few different times. Um, it was pretty handy. Yeah, and but the thing about that, I was like, okay, as soon as you do this, we're busted. Because on the other side of the door, it was nothing but like large cubicle office areas. And when you turn the air upside down and spray it, it's you loud. have, yeah, yeah, it's loud and you have to spray it for at least what, three to four, maybe five seconds. Yeah, because that and density of the air is what trips the, the sensor, right? And, uh, luckily it was near the end of the day and most of the employees were gone. So we didn't have to worry about that. And we were just trying to, yeah, but know, no one prove said, our point. no one said anything and that stuff. It has like what the, is it called bitterance or something like yeah. the bitter. Anyway, it makes it super bitter if you smell it, and it was like this cloud of smoke. So people were walking through it, and you could see them like, you know, like doing that with their mouth. And they didn't know where it was coming disgusting. from either. So. And no one asked questions. They're just like, well, there's some guys here. They're probably supposed to be here because they're there. You and know, and so. there's several other methods of tripping these rack sensors too, right? Uh, I mean, vapor, like the vape pens, you could do it with that. Or yeah, Dave Kennedy's Dave Kennedy uh, has this cool video of this, taking this gigantic pup with a vape pen and blowing it through a server room door. Uh, it's got the biometric sensor and everything, and it just pops right open. David so. Olam did one like where he sprayed a uh, sprayed some whiskey like from his mouth. Uh, between the crack and it tripped the rack sensor. Like, yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of different ways of doing this. And of course, it depends on the request for exit, uh, sensor to the manufacturer. Yeah, and the angle and everything. Yeah. All right. So, um, another guy I work with and I, we, uh, we had to get into this facility and the build, it was a pretty big building, but they only rented one level of this, of these suites. So, um, I prefer like the, the larger engagements because they're often, it's often easier to kind of blend in. And so when you have one where it's a single floor and it, like a single point of entry, those are a lot more difficult because they're usually smaller places where everybody knows faces. They know if you're new or not. So we decided to wait until after hours and uh, we were going to get in. We, after some recon, we figured out when everybody left and when the cleaning crew was there and all that. So, um, one thing we did not figure out was that the elevators require badge access after a certain time. So the elevators didn't work. So luckily we were able to get into the stairwell and go up and the entrance from the, sta the stairwell had the, uh, was the four pin Kabata style, where, you know, it was just like the four buttons that you push. And so... And you mean, could use it like a magnet to, to bypass those old things. Yeah, but, so yeah, I mean those are it. super easy. So we were like, well, let's just see how lucky we get. So uh, we were trying pin codes, trying certain patterns because people love patterns, you know, with with pin codes on those things. They're worn too. Yeah, and some of the buttons were worn down. So on our thirteenth try, we figured out the the code. We opened the door. Uh, the cleaning crew was on the other side. We were hearing them talking. So we we walk in. They see us, and we just didn't pay any attention to them. You know, like we belonged there. And uh, we this was a, a financial client. We were able to get into every single room of that entire suite. We were able to get into the sensitive files, like the actual uh, uh, filing cabinets and things, and took pictures. We walked around and all the cubicles, you know, there were so many that had usernames and passwords written under, but they had them hidden under their keyboard or under their, uh, I mean, this, their pencil This has been holders. a problem since, I don't know, like computers were first around, you know, yeah, people writing passwords their passwords existed. down and stuff. Yeah. So, you know, we found all these credentials. We did all this stuff. We picked we picked the locks to all the shredder bins because they were using these crappy master locks. So you basically look at it really hard and it just opens for you. And so we were getting all this stuff and taking pictures. Uh, it's probably true. You'd probably try that and it would work. Uh, there's actually one where you can hit it on the side with a hammer really hard and it will pop open. You don't even need a key. Uh, it's a master, is that the master lock number three or number five? Adrian? Uh, yeah, I think it's the number five or something. You can hit it just right on the side and it'll open. Yeah. So I know I think I've seen uh oh great Bosnian building something like that. Like I think you can use the hammer even the backside of the Yeah, yeah. 
So either, either way, they're shitty locks. So if you want to really protect something, don't buy those. Um, so we had gone through the thing, and so we were told, okay, so the security guards monitor all of these live feeds from their security guard station downstairs. So make sure you avoid the cameras because they are very diligent. And so we're like, okay, well, I hope that's the case. So we had been in there an hour. We're like, okay, well, no one's coming yet. We directly, like we've seen the cameras, and we directly look, like, looked at them you know, for a second and then we keep going because we're trying to give him the benefit of the doubt. Like, how long does it take this guy to get up here to catch you? So anyway, after we had gone through all this stuff, we get, he, the security guard never came. So it's like, okay, what do we have to do to get caught? So we go back to the main entrance. Uh, it's these double glass doors, and there was, a, there was a gap big enough to put something through. So I had a coat hanger, and then I had some napkins from Starbucks. So I do this coat hanger, and I put a big wad of napkins on the end, and I stick it through the door, trying to get the, the sensor on the other side to trigger just to see if it would. So I'm sitting here doing this and like going from the bottom all the way up to the top of the door, like over and over like this. I know it looks stupid, and the camera is right behind us, and that didn't work. Like we, were, we, and we stood there for a few more minutes, and we're like, okay, what else can we try? So by this time, I think it was probably about an hour and 20 minutes, hour and a half, maybe longer than that. We're like, all right, well, let's do jumping jacks. So we set all of our stuff down, and we faced the camera, and we're both literally doing jumping jacks, like waving at the camera, and the guy never came. So, uh, I mean, they had all their physical security resting on a crappy Cobb-style lock and the hopes that a guy was watching the monitor. So Because usually that's the uh, compensating control for the lack of, of physical access restriction or whatever they're using for access control. Well, we got a security guard. Okay, well, what is he doing or she doing? Knitting a blanket, uh, watching, and, and I say this as a joke, but honestly, this happened. <clears throat> this happened. We walk into another facility, me, Brent, and uh, our buddy Drew, and Drew looks very, uh, very executive. He's got, he's an older guy, and he's got this kind of news anchor voice, and uh, we're like, all right, well, we're going to be contractors, and you forgot your badge at the corporate facility. He's like, okay, and we found out that you could get the, uh, you could get the employee temporary badges just by having the last uh, four, like your extension, your phone extension, and your name. Didn't ask for ID or anything. So we walk in, this lady is a security guard. She's, she's an armed security guard. She's sitting there and she's knitting a blanket. We, we actually, we walked in behind her because we had already gotten in Yeah, the we building. got in the back. So we came up from behind her and she was knitting, seriously knitting. And she had made a lot of progress on her. Well, it is funny though, because <laughs> we're sitting there, we're watching her. She's like, oh, hey. And we're like, uh, and he goes, oh yeah, I'm, uh, I'm John Doe from, from corporate and these guys are here to test the latency, uh, issues with the network and, um, you know, some BS story that we dropped. And he's like, I need a, I need a replacement badge. I forgot my badge with my laptop. And she's like, oh, no problem. Well, what's your extension? And we had looked up the extension online. So he drops the extension and he ends up getting this one day badge that had access to the entire facility. Yeah. And, uh, we ended up walking in and, she didn't ask, didn't bat an eye or anything. It's like, oh, okay, we'll just sign in. We're like, we're signing in. And as we're doing this, we're also looking at all the visitors and the, the vendors and everything. And then we walk into the facility. She goes back to knitting her blanket. So, I mean, some of these people, I know that this job can become boring. And uh, security guards, in, in general, it's not a fun job. And you're, you're, some people are itching for an incident to happen. That way it's some excitement. Yeah. But uh, in other cases, they're just sitting there and they're, eating up their time listening to music or audiobooks or watching Hulu or knitting blankets or whatever. We also found out that blanket was for, I believe, her grandson's birthday that yeah, was she like told us two her weeks life later. So, yeah, we found out a lot of information from her just uh, by standing there and watching her knit a blanket. So, all right. So when they just don't buy it. So oftentimes when you're sitting there and, you know, they're, they're not buying your lies. They're like, well, this is, this is a lie. This is whatever. Uh, what we like to do is, is uh, we layer our guises before we give them the real letter of authorization or get out of jail free card. Before we say, yeah, we're actually legitimate, here's the real letter, please contact this person. We try to, you know, stack our lies. So uh, oftentimes, like for an example, you know, with the inventory, we're here to do key inventory or we're here to do test uh, network connectivity speed because we're running some new cabling or whatever. Uh, well, they don't, they don't buy that. Well, then you pull out the fake letter of authorization. 
Well, actually, we're with XYZ Security Testing, and we're here doing, uh, we're just testing some of the locks. We're going to replace them and this and that. Well, they don't buy that. Okay, well, then you can default back. You don't want to stack too many lines because at that point, they're going to, when you give them the real letter, they're going to be like, wait a minute, yeah, you're that's full just of a, crap. Yeah, that's just <laughs> another letter. How many letters do you have in your pocket? You know? <laughs> Does this one work? Does that, that one work? That's like the magic trick where they keep pulling out their handkerchiefs, so. So, I mean, but the point of the fake letter, too, is, again, is for that instant response and escalation procedures. Are they escalating? Are your people aware uh, that, you know, they need to be following these policies and these procedures? Yeah, and, uh, you know, as Tim mentioned, that's always a risk when you give a fake letter first, because if they don't buy it, then anything else you say after that, they're like, okay, you're, you're lying, come with me. So, I mean, there, there are times, uh, there's a time where I went on site to do an assessment and the client notified the people that I was coming. And so I had been there, I think, five minutes. And I picked the lock on an external door. It ended up just being an, an HVAC closet, so I couldn't really go anywhere unless I was going to climb through some vents, which I did not want to do that day. And uh, and so as soon as I closed that door, this gigantic bear of a man starts, like, barreling down on me. I'm like, whoa, here's my letter. And he was like, no. And I was like, seriously, please read the letter. He's like, nope coming with me so they you know I had to follow this guy and uh, went through the whole process and uh, that one actually ended ended up being okay but sometimes you'll you'll have those unfortunate the unfortunate situations where uh, the client might want to look good on paper so they'll do whatever it takes to make sure they look good on paper uh, so that's unfortunate well that's what's important too when you're doing this your rules of engagement your kickoff call and stuff is establishing hey the client is going to do everything within their means to prevent law enforcement, local law enforcement or federal law enforcement from being called. That way, you know, us or guys on our team aren't, you know, end up in jail, you know, until this gets sorted out. Um, one thing that happened, <clears throat> I was helping one of the guys on our team, uh, Michael Bourne. He, uh, I, I was like, hey, you know, when we saw this video online where this guy had gotten into several places with a ladder. Uh, and we're like, let's, let's try this. <laughs> you know, Why so, not? So he buys a ladder, and uh, he's got like a flannel shirt. He's there to look at the, uh, the the sprinkler heads because there's a defect on these sprinkler heads, and we're going to replace them or whatever. Well, we look up the property manager, the, the person that owns the property of, of this building that this uh, corporation's renting out, and we ended up forging a letter saying that the property manager's there, and he's testing all these facilities to get the uh, numbers off of the sprinkler heads because they need to be replaced. And he ended up getting into the facility. Well, he's there for a while, and then somebody ends up, after he plants a rogue access point so that we can connect to it from outside, uh, somebody comes up to him and challenges him. Well, who are you with? Wait a minute. No, I don't know. And then they look at the letter. The letter was super legit, and I was really proud of this letter because I would spend some time on it, and, uh, and I was waiting, eagerly waiting you know, for them to call. You used punctuation and everything. I did. It didn't look like a Nigerian scam. And um, so they they read the letter and they didn't buy it. They they were not going to uh, believe this guy. So they actually call the real property manager, and they hand the phone to him. They're like, he wants to talk to you. And he's like, oh crap. So they give him the phone. He goes, yeah, boss. Yeah, I think there was just some confusion. And he's talking over the guys. The guys yelling at him, who are you? What are you doing? He's like, yeah, I think there's just some confusion. You know, yeah. All right, well I'll take care of it. And he hangs up on the guy. And uh, and he's he's trying to leave the because he wants to get out of there as soon as possible because he had already planted a rogue access point. We're already able to connect to it from outside, so he's done his part. And now he just wants to get out of there because he doesn't want to get arrested. Well, they they were sitting there. The guy calls back, and it was a I mean it was it was really messy there for a bit. But somehow I I don't recall how, but he was a, he was able to to get one of the other points of contact to vouch for him. And, and he was able to, to leave without getting arrested. But, you know, again, you know, it's just, it, there's these risks here because some people are, they are not going to buy your story. They don't care. Some people are, they're, they're going to check, you know, and that's the good thing. That's what you should be doing, right? Yep. All right, let's move on. So, uh, so bug out. You guys are going to love this, this next little clip here. So, yeah. Yeah. And you're going to watch it over and over and it's just going to hurt every time. It's but there, there is a reason though. that we have this on here. So, uh, yeah, Tim, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, <clears throat> it was before we ran out that fire escape before. And I've heard some other people, when they we're sharing stories of different cons, they're like, oh, yeah, I was, you know, these security guards were chasing after me, and, I, you know, I was running and jumping over stuff. And I'm like, why? 
Why are you doing there's that? There's no need to do that. Yeah, because that, there's a risk there. First of all, if they're armed security guards and they think you stole something, they may shoot you. You know, you don't know. Or they may tackle you. There's a lot, there's a, a too much liability there. So don't go, you know, I'm a parkour es- expert and I'm awesome and I can do this and that. Don't do that. I mean, there's, it's really unnecessary for these types of assessments because that's what your letter of authorization is for. You're caught. Give them the benefit of the doubt. You know, let them, okay, well, you're done. Give up. You know, it's, it's, there's, there's two, there's safety risk there. So, so don't, uh, don't try to fight the security guards or push them because that's, that's not in scope. That's never in scope. To my knowledge, I, I mean, for us, that no. is never in scope. I don't, I don't want that to be in scope. Either, yeah. Honestly. When the security guard tries to tackle that. me, I'm going to, I'm going to throw him and then I'm going to run. No, you're not. Yeah, that's plus, I mean, if the, I'm going to hide this because that's just very awful to see, but, um, but you know, if, like Tim's saying, if if you are caught and they think that something bad happened and you run away, now what's going to happen next? They're going to call the police and say, hey, got a guy wearing this just ran down the street. And we think he's still, and now you've got the police searching oh. for you. So that's just not a good way to go. Um, yeah, and so when it was time to leave, make sure that you've cleaned up everything. If you planted key loggers or rogue access device, something like that, uh, make a note of it uh, and clean it up. If you can't clean it up and you have to get out of there and still trying to be covert without, you know, without being seen or caught, make sure you tell the client, hey, there's a, uh, there's a USB key logger in this one machine and I couldn't get it. Don't just leave it there. That's very unprofessional and it's, uh, it poses more risk. So. And make sure you're taking good notes too because oftentimes you're like, oh man, I forgot whose office that was that I got in there and dropped my rubber ducky into their system and okay, well. Lost that $60 item. Yeah. Or, you know, again, you know, you're going back to write your report and the client asks, well, it says here that you obtained access to five offices. Whose offices did you get access to? Uh, yeah, five. I don't know. <laughs> you know, if you don't have time to write it down, I mean, you're not going to walk through because it's covert, right? You're not going to sit there and just take notes. Oh, well, I'm here. Got access there. I got access here because you're sweating, your, your adrenaline's pumping. Grab their business card off their desk. That way you can write it down later. Take a quick snapshot of, uh, of you know, their nameplate or whatever. Uh, you know, the different departments. Take a snapshot of that. I like to use the restroom as my office when I am in these places. I go straight to the restroom. It gives me time to clean up, freshen up. That way I'm not sweating bullets and people are like, well, that guy looks nervous yeah. or whatever. But it also gives me opportunity to sit there and go through my pictures, go through my logs and say, okay, I have everything I need. That way I can report on it and I have a really accurate report. I have names of people. If I have to get names, that way I can give it to people or the, whoever the point of contact is when we're doing the report review. Yep. So uh, I know we're almost out of time. We'll talk about a few recommendations and countermeasures. Uh, you know, we talk about security awareness training. We, we teach a security awareness training class. And in that, we try to make it much more than just a PowerPoint or, you know, you all have had to sit down and do those click through tests where it's like the multiple choice and, you know, you Sally, Sally sees John come in. Should she check to see if his badge works? Yes, no. And things like that. And it takes forever and you hardly remember anything it says. So, uh, you know, try to try to make it more hands on or to really show the impact. Uh, something that we'll do is we'll take our tools or maybe even do a physical assessment on the, for the client a few days before. And during the security awareness training, we're showing videos and pictures of what we were able to get into in that current facility show with tools you know like the stuff in here that's maybe a hundred bucks worth of equipment that anybody can buy and throw together and so we'll show these things and just how and we always make sure to use tools that are publicly available that anybody can go get just to show hey uh, Joe Schmo could go buy this shove knife for ten bucks and get in your back door and he's doing whatever he wants to. So. Or how easy it is to make it under the door tool when people are still using lever handles on super secure rooms and stuff. So. <clears throat> um, go back for a second. Okay. Yeah, again, you don't, you don't have to be paranoid, but uh, you know, you got to be aware. Because especially now in the age of hacktivism is, is so prevalent and then terrorism and stuff like that. So not only for security, but for safety too. Yeah. So it's so, so important that when you're hiring these vendors too, don't go, don't scrape the bottom of the barrel to say, well, this security contractor company is super cheap. Um, let's get them. And then they hire whoever to sit there at the desk. They're not, they're not alert. They're not aware. They have no Knit training, sweaters. proper training and they're knitting sweaters or blankets. Yeah. 
And hackers do not care how hard your network is if they can just walk in and employ a cup of Starbucks and then, you know, ask for the password. Uh, I say this because it happened. I went to a facility one time, I grabbed a, a tray of Starbucks prior to, I walked in, it was a new building, and I said, hey, yeah, we're running uh, the new voice over IP, have you had any issues? Well, yeah, we've had a few issues because everybody always has networking yeah, issues. Yeah, the internet's always slow. Yeah, so uh, I was like, oh, okay, we're just here to test the network connectivity, and, and I'm giving them Starbucks. As I'm sitting there, I'm talking to them. I was like, oh, could you log in? Actually, I'm going to have to ask you to log in a few different times. Do you mind just writing your password down for me? And then they write down their password, and then I'm sitting there on their system for 45 minutes. Yep. I mean, this kind of stuff happens more than you, you would imagine. You don't have to, it doesn't have to be some super high-tech method of gaining access or obtaining passwords. People right. are just obviously, I mean, most of the time, uh, super friendly and helpful. Yep. So, and then, uh, we'll, I know we're almost out of time again. We'll go over quick uh, just recommendations. Obviously, clean desk policy. So many times you've gone into places and they've hidden stuff. So, make sure you show the importance of clean desk policy where people aren't hiding their stuff, you know, sticking it underneath their keyboard or, again, under their pencil holder or inside their desk. We always look there. We always find it so it's not secure. Uh, teach about, you know, password management programs, things like that. And for the love of God, don't, just don't use those. So make We've sure actually seen by, like little folders like this yeah. in unlocked desks that's just sitting there. So you just open it and it's like, what? <laughs> they even labeled it for me. Chase.com, <laughs> okay. Uh, remind the security vendors what the risks are outside and obviously, uh, you know, again, inquisitive security guards or diligent security guards are what's important. Uh, remind them, you know, this is your job. This is what we're paying you for, especially if they're contractors and you're hiring them to come in and per perform the service. Yeah, and uh, if, if they do things like hand over their entire set of keys, make sure that they don't hand over their entire set of keys. That's always awful. Yeah, remind them that they are the first barrier. They're the first barrier of security. I mean, that's, that's the point. Other than the actual building itself, they're the first person, the human person is sitting there. And then every employee, too. Every employee is part of security. That everybody, there's a, Especially if you've only got one guard, Make sure the rest of your employee body also understands their role in security, that they are the eyes and ears as well, and they should be escalating when they see something. Yeah, and then we talked earlier about shredder bins and things. Make sure you put a decent lock on that. Make sure that you're not able to reach your hand in those. Uh, there's so many times where we've just opened them or you know pulled things out of them, and, and it, it was always sensitive information. So, and then uh, you know talk about physical security too. Make sure. If you spend a lot of money on dimple locks, make sure that you're installing them correctly. Make sure the strike plate is installed correctly. You want to look at things such as the uh, the physical gap around the doors, because what good is a dimple lock if if you can stick you know a shove knife on the side of it or use an under the door tool for a lever handle on the other side. So just just make sure that you're reading the. Uh, you know, the instructions on how to do those things properly. Also, make sure that you have intrusion detection systems on your walls. If you don't have uh, f proper firewalls in your uh, in your data center, it's like not floor to ceiling or anything like that, that you at least have some kind of fence or IDS or something there to trip if somebody's trying to climb over it. Because there's been several times where I just climb over it. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, now I'm in here. Yeah, and just make sure that things are set up to make sense. Like you see this, this Kava style with the lever handle on a gate and you just stick your arm through the gate and open it. So, and, and then this isn't our picture, but we have seen things this poor. So, and, and you laugh, but I mean, we see things like this all the time. So, uh, just make sure that you're using common sense and setting these things up. So, I know we kind of got we're rushing here this last part of the uh, the presentation. So, if you guys have any other questions or anything, feel free to uh, ask them now or or uh, yeah. Does after. anybody anybody have any questions? Yeah. In this? What's in the box? What's in the box? What's in the box? What's in the box, man? <laughs> uh, it's just a Raspberry Pi. I've got a Raspberry Pi running. I uh, um, actually have Kali on here, um, and then I've got a few different sensors on there that I can plug and play. So I can plug from from HID to um, to the NFC chips or anything like that. So. Yeah. You right? Anybody else? Yeah. No. Uh, I've been arrested, no. but not for this. Yeah. <laughs> that's that. Ta that's out of scope of the talk, though. So, but yeah, I, fortunately, we have not. There, there have been a few times with uh, some of the guys where, uh, and, and even myself, where it w got close to actually calling the police. 
but we were actually to, able to de-escalate it in time. So uh, as of this point, no, and I hope that always is the answer. Well, that's a good question. You know, most of the time, like if you if you just uh, if you seek the career path toward offensive security for pen testing or security consultant or whatever, <clears throat> eventually you end up becoming a SME, like a subject matter expert. Um, and what our team likes to do is we encourage each other. You know, what are you passionate about? What do you want to do? Uh, Brent and I were passionate about social engineering and physical security, so we started. Uh, you know, getting a lot more of those engagements. And as we were doing that, developing methodologies, doing trainings, stuff like that. Um, and then uh, as our team grows, we see who's strong in that area. Because you don't want to hire somebody that, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, I want to do social engineering. And they, they have a hard time talking to people. Yeah, well, we can talk more. I think we're actually out of time. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for listening to us today. Yeah.